So welcome everyone to the very first session in our Teacher, Technician and Advisor workshop series. My name is, is Olivia and I work in the recruitment and outreach team at NUA and you'll be seeing a lot of me throughout this workshop series. So we're really sorry not to be able to welcome you on campus at the moment, but hopefully this online extravaganza will give you some resources and information to take back to the classroom, whether that's online or in person. So during this strange and uncertain time, we're very aware that many of your students will be feeling anxious about their futures and we want to support you and them the best way that we can. So we also want to keep you up to date with how the NUA community is approaching the COVID-19 situation and we've pulled together some useful FAQs that hopefully will answer any questions you or your students might have about how we're dealing with the situation and we'll put a link to those in the chat for you. So some housekeeping bits before we get going, if you could keep your audio and video off just for the majority of the presentations today, um, and then there will be an interactive element in Susan's presentation a bit later. And at that point, if you're happy to share your video, you can let us know in the chat function and we will give you the permissions to share your video with us. Um, we are also recording the session this morning, so if you do have any technical problems or we have any technical problems, please do not worry, we will make sure that you have access to this after the session. If you have any questions as well, do put those in the chat function, which will be open for today's session, and we will get your questions answered um, either throughout the presentations by a member of staff that's on hand or will be back on at the end and can answer any questions then. So what to expect from the, this morning's session, I'll be handing over to Tom who is primed and ready to go for the introduction to Norwich University of the Arts and then I'll be chipping into a few of those slides as well and then at 10.30 we'll be joined by Susan Coles for a really motivating presentation all about the issues you and your students might be facing at the moment and how to keep up your well-being and motivation. So now I'll hand over um, to Tom and we'll get going with the introduction. Brilliant. Thanks, Liv. Um, I'm just going to put out a mini disclaimer for any of you who attended the Nurturing Bright Futures event. This introduction is, is the same effectively as that. Um, but let's look to make a start. So we're going to be covering the following areas in this short introduction. So who we are as an institution, the courses that we have, at NUA. The contemporary creative careers that are out there, we're going to touch on that. We're going to look at some of our industry connections and then we're going to finish this section with looking at our free activities that we offer at NUA. So before we kind of get into the main bulk of the presentation, I, I wanted to start off by introducing you to this quote by the author Anita Cruz and she writes, without imagination there would be no creativity. Without creativity there would be nothing. Our creativity is massively important to us in any, any part of life, whether it's um, just kind of uh, how we learn, whether it's looking at our habits, our cultural identity, creativity affects every single part of our life. And this is something that we're really keen to affirm in the workshops that we deliver um, through our outreach provision to, to let people know that what they do creatively really matters to them and to other people around them. All of our lives at any given time, we're affected by thousands of different creatives through whether it's our food packaging, what we wear, the buildings we sit in, the, the car interiors we might have. We can't avoid creativity. So we're really keen to remind people of, of the power of creativity in everyday life. Now let's get started on an introduction to who we are as an institution. So Norwich University of the Arts is a top rated creative specialist institution. Over the past few years, we've had some particularly strong accolades. Norwich is one of the safest, happiest and most creative cities in the UK, according to various bodies, uh, such as Witch, such as Right Move, uh, such as The Guardian. But our, our most recent accolade, which is um, listed on, on this little list on, on the presentation, is that we have the, the strongest retention rate in the whole of the UK. So that's something we're really proud of. Those students that start with us, finish with us. We've got the highest rate of that in the whole country. So that's something we're really delighted by. But we've also got that list of additional accolades that we've achieved over the past couple of years. We're 175 
years old now. We started off, we were born out of the Norwich School of Painters and as times progressed, we introduced our fine art and graphics courses to start off with. And now we have over, well, we have 19 different subjects as we've kind of molded in line with what the creative industries have been after. And we currently have 2,500 students roughly in our community as well. So we, we're continuing to grow over the past 10 years, we've almost doubled in size. So some of the updates of what's been going on in our community recently. So I think the, the most significant thing is we have appointed our second uh, chancellor. Um, Ama Asante um, has joined us and we will be celebrating her inauguration shortly when, when things get started up again. So that's something we're really delighted by, seeing how she can um, showcase us across the world through what she does as a director and also see how we can learn from her on our, across our courses as well. We have our new courses, we're introducing acting and we're also introducing fashion marketing and business um, to our portfolio of courses um, for this um, from this September onwards. We have our graphics and games pathway. So some of you will be aware that we introduced our BSc courses um, a few years ago now. Well, what we've done is we've um, kind of repositioned them slightly within our portfolio of courses. So the user experience design is one of the four graphics pathways now on offer. So that includes graphic design, graphic communication, design for publishing, and now user experience design as well. And then we, for games development, we've put that alongside games, art and design in the gaming courses. We have year zero. Now year zero isn't a foundation course. It's an alternative to a foundation. It's um, for students that, that know that they want to go into a specific subject area, but maybe don't quite have the background to get straight into year one. Now, we've got year zero options for all of our courses, but for those two new ones. So for all of our subjects, apart from acting and fashion marketing and business, we now have a year zero option. We're really excited about our online degree show. Now, when I first heard that we were running an online degree show, I was a little bit, skeptical about what that might look like but actually it's been explained to me exactly how it's going to work and its functionality it's designed as a shop window uh, for potential employers so they're going to be able to search through our students work whether it's looking for an individual um, through specific types of work or the specific subjects they're going to be able to to see not just the degree show work but a backlog of that student's work which they wouldn't be able to at a regular degree show and they're also going to be able to contact um, the individual students directly through that channel as well. We're really excited about what that, that's going to look like and how people are going to interact with that. So that will be kicking off from mid-July and that's going to be something really special. Um, in terms of September, we do plan to open up in September. We're anticipating that it's likely to be that we're going to have a, a bit of blended learning going on. So what we mean by that is it's going to be a mixture of online teaching, a bit like this kind of context, but also a little bit of um, getting students into studios at appointed times and making sure that social distancing measures are in place as well. So they're able to access the facilities that they'll need. And we also are going to be introducing in 2021 our, our new Duke Street Riverside building. Um, so this is really exciting. It's going to be, um, an, there's going to be a new large um, multi-purpose le um, lecturing uh, space in there, as well as a series of seminar rooms and also student accommodation within this new facility. So that's something we're really excited by for next year. Now, looking at the, the subjects that we currently offer, um, we have our, our two faculties at NUA. We split our subject areas down into these two faculties. We've got art and media is our first. And within this, we have acting, animation, animation and visual effects, film and moving image production, fine art, games art and design, games development and photography. And in our second faculty, which is design and architecture, we have the following list of subjects, which is architecture, design for publishing, fashion, fashion communication and promotion, fashion marketing and graphic communication, graphic design, illustration, interior design, textile design, and user experience design. Now, unfortunately, this presentation, within this presentation, I won't be covering a bit of an outline on each of those subjects. But if that's something you'd like to learn more about, a great way of doing that is obviously going to our website and clicking on the initial video, the introductory video for each course, is a great way of getting a feel for what that subject's all about. Right. 
So <clears throat> something that we are really keen to affirm to, to students that we see across the UK is the variety of opportunities that are available to them if they choose to pursue their creativity. Um, I'm going to mention this a bit later, but more and more we're finding we're, we're speaking to students as young as year eight at the moment to make them realise that actually there's a potential future with their creativity. So they might want to choose um, a creative GCSE and that has a knock on effect to them choosing a creative A level often as well. And we like to remind them that actually it's not just about being an artist or an art teacher. There's on this list that you see on screen, there's over 170 different careers. Now, I apologise that the quality of this isn't fantastic. So if you would like to receive this list, you can email us and we'll send you out our Your Creative Future booklet um, with, with a full uh, extensive list of, of typical careers students might want to go into with their creativity. This list, as you, you'll have seen, hopefully, um, it gives you an idea that each subject area has typical um, career paths that you might want to go into. Some students might have heard of, they might have an awareness of what a graphic designer does or what an architect might do, but they'll probably never have heard of things like what a grip does or what a best boy does or what a roto artist does. So we love to use this as a starting point, as a kind of almost like a research um, point for them to find out what these careers are, um, what skills are involved with each of these careers, uh, how they access them, how much they earn, where these jobs are, all those types of things to just affirm that actually there's a real future in their creativity and much of these areas as well cross over with areas like mathematics like storytelling like um, physics psychology it's not just about exclusive creativity and making actually it crosses over with lots of other fields as well Okay, so I want to introduce you to a few of our, our graduates that are doing some particularly interesting things. So this is Joe, and um, Joe graduated a couple of years before me um, from from NUA. Um, so Joe um, was actually a graduate from Games Art and Design, and he went on to work in the visual effects industry. So. Joe is a, a VFX production manager. Uh, most recently he worked for, for Warner Bros, but he's also worked for Double Negative. And he's worked on films like um, Dunkirk, Pete's Dragon, Jupiter Ascending, and more recently he's worked on Wonder Woman and the um, Fantastic Beasts uh, series as well, working on the visual effects for those types of projects. And that's because he used those transferable skills that he learned from the games art and design course and applied them to the film industry. Now, we've also got people like Emily. So Emily is one of my friends. She was a couple of years below me on the fine art course at NUA. And Emily, um, went, after she graduated from fine art, she went and set up a, a company with one of her friends um, from the course. Uh, it was called Rhombus, or is called Rhombus and Pineapple. And they really wanted to get into the, some of the top galleries in, across the country, and, and also not just this side of the pond, but also in, in the States as well. So they've developed a series of, of cards, effectively, really high-end gift cards that are sold in the gift shops of those top galleries. And um, she, she really enjoyed that, but actually she wanted to explore her own practice as well. So she's gone on to develop her, her own painting style. And Emily's really quick at banging out paintings. And uh, she's, she works with a real passion, intensity, and also she really loves um, kind of vivid color. So uh, she's based now down in Topshin in Exeter, and she also exhibits across the country with her work. Last year, she made 100,000 through her work alone. Um, so she knows how to not just develop great work, but also how to network um, with galleries, but also using social media as well. So she's a real success story of, of how to, to develop your practice in a professional context after graduating. We also have our Ideas Factory at NUA, which some of you might, might know of. It's our business incubation centre. So it's a way of, of uh, helping our, some of our students to set up their own businesses. And Denisa here is an example of that. Denisa actually worked uh, when she was a student as an outreach ambassador. And now she, um, she is a professional photographer, freelance photographer. She's an award-winning photographer as well. She won the European Photography Prize um, for some of her work on iconic looks. Um, and she now lectures on our photography course as well. So she's a great example of the, the type of student, uh, the type of direction that students can go in. So they can develop their practice alongside teaching as well. And then we've got Amy. So Amy is really interesting. Once again, she was another student that worked alongside our recruitment team. Uh, she was actually a graduate from graphic communication. 
uh, she was really gutted when she she came to study with us she was really torn between graphics and mathematics and she was really unsure which one she wanted to do but luckily she found a career that kind of blends the two really nicely so she now works for um, foolproof which is a user experience company and she's a senior user experience consultant she designs websites for the likes of domino's pizza easyjet suzuki and the post office and she makes sure that the the journey is easy to navigate that the, it's a, a very engaging products that, that the consumer is engaging with, that they are um, able to, to get from A to B really easily, that they're able to have a sense of reward and satisfaction out of using that product. And sh she can literally take that across the world um, with, with her skills. Uh, Foolproof have offices, offices in Australia and Singapore, as well as London and Norwich. So she's got the chance to kind of travel with that as well. And these are high earning areas. So someone in, in her position is earning around £52,000 a year on average. So there is money to be made in your creativity. And this is a list of those typical companies that we collaborate with year in, year out. These change a bit year to year. Um, we, for example, work alongside Penguin Books on our illustration course quite a lot. They set um, competition briefs for our students to design um, book jackets as well as poster designs. We work alongside the likes of Myris Aircraft Seating. So they've worked alongside our textile design course uh, recently where we've been designing um, some fabric covers for East Indian Airlines. And so students are able to kind of get a feel for what it's like to work in that kind of professional capacity. We've had other textile graduates and have gone on to work for Kath Kitson and Sally Wood, who then comes back and lectures with us uh, to our fashion and textile students. We've had students that have been headhunted by Disney Pixar. Uh, some of our students uh, a few years ago won a, a BAFTA for a game they developed called T TikTok Toys. And uh, Disney headhunted one of our students um, that, that produced T TikTok Toys. And uh, she now works in the Disney Pixar studios in London. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, so behind each of these logos is a story. And this is something we're expanding on year after year. Right. It's not just about developing those creative making skills though. It's also about developing a, a kind of a business professionalism. So that's why we look to develop our students' transferable skills. Now, this is done in line with our creative industry liaison group. So this is a group of different companies from the creative industries that inform us as to what they're looking for in our graduates aside from their making skills. And they've told us that after these 10 skills, resilience and ability to meet deadlines and deliver a brief, flexibility and adaptability, showing attention to detail, an ability to communicate with colleagues and partners, to be able to respond well to feedback, to work in a team, to handle customers and clients, to demonstrate a positive attitude and an ability to interpret a brief. Now, these 10 skills are something that we embed as part of our teaching at NUA to develop a student's individual professionalism. But the, these 10 skills actually work really well for students' personal statements when applying to NUA as well. We, we've developed um, a worksheet that students can do in their own time um, to help them start to draft a personal statement based on these 10 skills. So if that's something that you're interested in, please do get in touch with us because it's a really useful resource for students to be able to get the ball rolling and to realise the skills that they have and how they're appropriate to different subjects that they might want to apply for. So in terms of entry requirements, um, we've got on the screen at the moment our year zero and year one entry requirements. I'm just going to read out the entry requirements for A-levels and BTECs because that tends to be the, the standard entry route. Um, so for year zero, we'd be looking for two Cs at A-level or for BTEC entry, we'd be looking for a merit merit pass. And for year one entry, we'd be looking for three Bs at A-level. And for the, the BTEC, we'd be looking for a distinction merit merit. However, the grades are important, but what's essential to us is seeing a student's creative potential. Um, so for the vast majority of courses, we do look for um, a portfolio. And the portfolio advice is something that we deliver um, as standard. This is something that's been our, our, one of our most popular activities over the years. Uh, it's something that, that we like to, to do in line, obviously, with each of our courses. And we like to get an awareness of what other institutions are doing in this respect as well. 
and, and we're particularly proud of what we offer in terms of our advice and this is something that can be accessed in your classrooms but also of course on our website and on each individual subject area as well you can see the specific types of work they like to to see in their portfolios but it's not just about the portfolio application we've also as you know introduced the acting course and so for our acting course we're looking for students to audition for their places there now um, we are offering our audition advice alongside our portfolio advice if that's something that that you might be interested in or that your colleagues might be interested in and both of these sessions last about half an hour but i'll talk a little bit more about that shortly so now i'd like to invite liv back in and i'm going to just mention and liv's going to men mention some of the free activities that we have going on for schools and colleges so to start off with we have the bigger picture so Within this, we have our Why Creative and Introduction to NUA presentations. Now, these are led by the recruitment team. They last from 15 minutes to about 45 minutes if they're, they're really kind of stretched out. And they're really appropriate for year eight to 13 students. It's a great way of giving, making them realize the variety of different careers they can go into with their creativity, and the economical value of creativity and the emotional value of creativity as well. So it's, it's a really good one to start off with. Uh, we like to open each of our workshops with something around this, but also we, we love to deliver this to those younger students to make them realize the value of creativity. Okay, so we also have uh, a standard. We, we attend career and higher education fairs as well. And th these are attended by the recruitment team, but also our ambassadors. And once again, we will see year eight to foundation level students. Um, but we just like to make sure that the appropriate students are attending those fairs that we go to, because we have gone to the other end of the country before um, to, to just see a, a series of maybe history students. Um, so it, it's important that we, we make sure that we're seeing the right audience when we're there. But that's something that we love to do. So taster sessions, we offer a wide range of taster sessions at NUA, and a large majority of these will take the form of creative workshops. So these are often led by our academic staff or the recruitment and outreach team, or at times also our student ambassadors. We also do work with a huge network of local artists and professionals that sometimes we bring in to deliver these on our behalf. We're very happy to arrange a bespoke workshop for you that can be on a subject of your choice from anywhere as short as 20 minutes through to two hours and for year eight up to foundation level students. Um, we would like to deliver these in person, but we've also got to grips with new and exciting ways of delivering these online, much like this session, and we've had really positive feedback so far. So we've actually been delivering a workshop every Wednesday online for students to sign up to independently. And I've put the link um, on the screen there for you in case you might want to send this out to your students. So far, we've had sessions on how to photograph your artwork, whether that's 2D or 3D work and also things like how to create a repeat pattern and both of those examples were actually delivered um, by those artists and professionals that I talked about and a lot of those sessions in the future will be as well so some really useful resources for your students to get involved with independently and then we have also started delivering critique workshops so these um, give students a real insight into the experience of a crit at university level these would be led by the recruitment team and are upwards of 45 minutes for years 12 or level three plus. So we run these in quite a fun and playful way and they really encourage students to be a little bit less precious about their work. Then just to give you a little bit of an insight into the academic taster sessions that we offer. So if you've signed up to a lot of the workshops as part of this series, you'll also get to grips with those and get to meet quite a few of our academics. An, ex an example of this is the Sculpture Matters workshop that we're running this afternoon. So hopefully you've nabbed your spot on that session. Um, that will be led by Desmond Brett, who you can see on the screen here, a fine art lecturer at NUA. And it's a diagnostic workshop that uses 3D making as a way to explore the links between different subjects. Um, so we can actually deliver this um, to your students directly as well. So if that's something you're interested in and you find this afternoon session really exciting, you can get in touch with us and we can make sure that that happens. 
We've also, by popular demand, added a second session for Sculpture Matters that will close this workshop series. So if you didn't manage to get a place on this afternoon's um, session, you can still book onto that second one later in the series. So back over to Tom. Thank you, Liv. Um, so we also have our applicant information. information. So um, as I mentioned, some of our, our most popular requests that we receive each year are for portfolio advice and we're anticipating similar for audition advice as well. This is led uh, generally by the recruitment team. It tends to last around 30 minutes, but can uh, be upwards um, to, to around an hour if, we'd like to, if you'd like us to include portfolio examples to kind of critique and review. And this is for year 12 to foundation level students. Ha. Um, personal statement workshops are something that, that we have found have been increasingly popular and actually work alongside the portfolio advice sessions really nicely. Um, once again, these are led by the recruitment team. It's using those, um, those 10 key skills that I mentioned previously, which are part of our, our, our profile game. Uh, so we like to play a little game with the students to get them to start thinking about their, their own kind of personal journey and their aspirations as well within their creative field. And that lasts uh, um, upwards of 30 minutes and is appropriate for year 12 to foundation level students. And something um, that works quite well alongside the portfolio advice as a, an additional kind of follow up is um, mock interviews or portfolio reviews. And these are led once again by the recruitment team and they last around 20 minutes per student. Um, so we get the chance to get an idea of, of what a student plans um, to showcase um, to their university. Uh, we give them a, a sense of how they might want to lay out their portfolio, other things they might not have considered that they might want to include from outside the classroom. We ask them the types of questions that will be asked during the interview process to kind of just adjust their mindset and get them ready for that context. So competitions, as many of you will already be aware, we run several competitions throughout the year. The first one I'd like to talk about is Beyond the Frame. So it's a national photography competition and culminates in an exhibition in around April time that this year was brought, on, brought online. Um, it's for year 10 all the way through to foundation and it's judged by a critically acclaimed panel of judges, a really exciting panel of judges to get involved with. Um, so do also have a look at the website for that. The online exhibition is still up there and useful to circulate amongst your students to get them inspired and looking forward to next year already. The next one I wanted to talk about is the Norfolk Art and Design Competition. Um, this is for students in um, sixth form or colleges studying in Norfolk. And unlike Beyond the Frame, it's multidisciplinary, so it's open to lots of different mediums, whether that's painting, all the way through to animation and film. Um, like Beyond the Frame, it does culminate in an exhibition that's normally at NUA and then has a really exciting tour across Norfolk in the summer. This year we've brought the exhibition online um, and it's up on the website already for you to look at. And we actually just announced the winner this week. So the piece that you can see on the screen here is the winning piece by Emily Doggett from Forbes and Andrews School. So Emily actually decided to tackle lockdown um, head on in her work. And this is a portrait that she's made using biro and white acrylic paint of her grandfather. And it's called Emotional Concealment, and it's all about his um, feelings around isolation and loneliness. So a really moving piece there. And you can see the really high standard of entries that we received this year if you have a look at the website and the address is on the screen there for you. And back to Tom. Thanks, Liv. So um, looking at things we can do on, on our campus, um, now the most obvious thing is our open day. So ironically, our open day is coming up this Friday and you can't come to our campus because it's uh, going to be online um, due to, to COVID-19, of course. Um, but yes, on Friday, that's when we have our next open day. So if your students might be interested, please pass on the word. The next thing is... Ah, yes, guided campus tours. Um, if students aren't able to make open days, it's great if you can get in touch with us, uh, with our recruitment team in particular, and we can arrange um, a guided campus tour with you. 
we have our masterclass workshops with the gallery at NUA. Now, the gallery at NUA is designed for our students, but we have artists from across the world that showcase there. Um, we've had, in, in recent times, we've had a Haywood touring show, which has been really exciting. We've had um, the Alfred Munnings exhibition for the more traditional end of the spectrum. And then my favorite piece of work that's been in there so far is the William Latham Mutator VR exhibition, um, where it's kind of digital interactive headsets. So there's all sorts of different types of work that are showcased there. Um, and it might be a case of we can arrange to either have an artist deliver a workshop in there, some of our students or academics with your, with your students uh, and staff. So do let us know if that's of interest, because um, there's some great opportunities to be had there. We have our user experience lab as well. So we've got a little picture of the user experience lab on screen now. And this is where students can test out websites, games, apps, and they can see how user friendly those things are. Um, we have um, the capacity to, to test out um, your, your websites and apps through our retina tracking software, as well as um, tracking the clicks and how people interact with these different products. So that's something that we'd love to share with you and um, for people to get a feel for how their designs work in reality. And we actually are running a workshop in this as part of our, our teachers and technicians and advisors um, series. And that's coming up on the 29th of June. So if that's something that you're interested in, we're running that over Zoom to give you an idea of how that might work. So, um, finally from me, um, please do get in touch with us. If there's any of these activities that you're interested in, we would love to work with you. All we need to know is the type of activity you're interested in, preferred kind of dates and timings or days of the week that work for you, as well as the year groups um, that you'd like to get involved with those activities. From that, we can start to, to put a plan together. And you can contact us um, by calling uh, the number on screen or uh, dropping us an email at student.recruitment.nua.ac.uk. Um, you could get in touch with us at, um, at NUA Outreach, or you can um, get in touch with us over the Facebook group that's mentioned on there as well. So then just to kind of give you an overview of what's to come in this workshop series. So I've put all of the workshops up on the screen for you. I'm not gonna talk through everyone, but there is a huge range of exciting activities that you could get involved with. So as I already mentioned, for those of you that have bagged your place on Sculpture Matters, that's happening this afternoon. And then you could do things like make a paper bodice and explore the relationship between 2D and 3D forms on the 23rd of June. And also, as Tom mentioned, if you wanted to find out about our new acting course, you can do that on the 1st of July with Experience, the acting course leader, and also um, get some of that audition advice that you could take back to any students that you have that might be interested. Um, so there's still time to book these. I've got the link at the bottom of the screen there. And we really want to see that you're making and creating as part of this workshop series. So anything that you make or any part of the process, do um, post on Instagram or send it to us in a direct message at NUA Outreach. And we'd love to see those. So I'll now um, be handing over to Susan and we'll get going with her very exciting presentation. Okay. Thanks, Liv. I'm here. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yep. Thank you, Tom. Hello, everybody. Um, wow, I don't know where to start, really. I suppose I should start with who I am and why I'm talking to you. But then when I look down this long list of people, I realise that I probably know about 85% of you, which is wonderful. Um, I think my image that I've put up kind of gives it away a little bit because you'll have worked out from that picture on the left hand side where I might be located, which is the wonderful northeast of England. And I am a, I, I'm all sorts of things, but I suppose if I have to sum it up in a sentence, I'm a, an arts creativity education consultant. I am a champion for art education. In the last decade or so, I've had to advocate for our subject at the very highest levels, including Parliament. You can see us there standing with our MPs that 
supporters in the old party parliamentary group for art, craft and design education. I'm really lucky that I work on PGCE courses. That lovely image at the bottom is a group of teachers that come annually to the Yorkshire Sculpture Park for an Arts Council Collection Day. Um, I'm blessed really in what I do and the reason that I do it all is that I love art. And the reason that I said yes to having this opportunity to talk to you today is that I've developed a very good working relationship in the last couple of years with the University of the Arts in Norwich, um, doing some outreach work with teachers and last year physically actually coming down to the campus for two days to take part in this. So welcome art teachers everywhere or art educators everywhere. And if you have ever been on one of my wellbeing courses, which some of you have been, I'm trying to move the slides on here, Olivia, but I'm not having any success by the way. Okay, um, thank you. If you've ever been on one of my wellbeing days, and some of you have, I always start off with a little warm up activity. And I've got three activities for you today, which you will just need to have a pen and a piece of paper or a, or a marker or a Sharpie pen. And this is a warm up that is based on Gillian Waring's work. It's actually one of her first major pieces of work. And it was entitled Signs That Say What You Want Them To Say and Not Signs That Say What Somebody Else Wants You To Say. And she randomly walked around London, giving members of the public a piece of paper and a pen and asking them to just write something on a piece of paper that came out of their head. And they're quite surprising really, you know, this, that smart young guy in the business suit saying I'm desperate and the police officer writing the single word help. And what Gillian Waring said is that a great deal of her work is about questioning handed down truths that we often say and believe the things that people tell us to say and believe. And what we need to do is be more honest in life. So this is actually from 1993, surprisingly enough. So I want you on your piece of A4 paper today to actually do that and I've done one this morning I'm just going to hold mine up to the camera it doesn't say an awful lot it says made in China and I'm going to explain that to you later on so I want you to do your big message but rather than hold it up which would be awkward because lots of you have got your videos off when you've done your message why don't you type it up in the chat and then if you type it up we can see what people have said what is your sign that says what you want to say and not what other people want you to say? So I'll give you a couple of minutes to do that. So when you put those now to one side and during the rest of the talk you can type them up and so we can all have a look at what you've put. Uh, I'm moving on to my next slide. This is a book that was written almost 30 years ago by Stephen Covey and it's called The Seven Habits of Highly Affected People. It's even more important nowadays to actually read things like this and if you're not a, a great reader by the way there's a very accessible podcast of this book. Covey is very much about you can only function in your life if you have the right kind of habits, but it's about balancing and renewing our resources, our energy, our health, so that we create a sustainable, long-term, effective lifestyle. And it actually talks about spiritual re renewal. It doesn't have to be in the sense of being religious, but it's something that we need to do in education. And he talks about something called an upward spiral, and he uses um, this example, which is in the sharpen the saw section. Right, I'm still not managing to forward these. So I'm glad that somebody else is doing it for me. Um, there's a story with this. This is habit number seven at sharpen the saw. So the story is like a parable. Supposing you were to walk through the woods one day and you met somebody who's working really feverishly to saw down a tree. What are you doing, you ask? Can't you see, comes a very impatient reply, I'm sawing down a tree. Well, you look exhausted, you say to him or her. How long have you been doing this? 
over five hours and I'm absolutely knackered because this is just hard work. And then you look down actually and you say, well, why don't you actually take a break for a few minutes? Because I've noticed that your saw isn't very sharp. And if you sharpen the saw, it would go faster. And the man or the woman cutting down the tree says, I don't have time to sharpen the saw. I am too busy sawing. Now that's an example for all of us because sharpening the saw is about renewing yourself physically, mentally, spiritually and emotionally. And I wonder where you are on the scale of sharpening of your, of your saw. So this is a diagram. You can just draw this on a piece of paper. You just do an arrow, right? And you imagine that the right hand side is the dullest, deadest part of the saw. And you imagine that the left is the really sharp part of the saw. Where do you think you are on there? Put a cross on there. You might be in the middle. You might be at the top end. You might be at the bottom end. You might be wavering about. In fact, some of you might say, my saw is very sharp because at the moment I'm at home most of the time. But when I'm at work, my saw is very dull. So that's entirely up to you how you do this. I want you to just think about it. Now, the other interesting thing is that when I was asked to do this talk today, I was given a kind of a brief, okay? And that brief was this. Discuss ways to try and keep students engaged alongside maintaining your own motivation and well-being. It actually, before I edited it slightly, said, discuss, I didn't say discuss, it said find ways. And I said, could we please make it discuss as ways? Because I don't know if I can actually tell people what the ways are to try and keep their students engaged. And I also think it's more important than just your students at the moment. I really do think that for all of our teachers out there, we've got to absolutely maintain our own motivation and our own well-being. And there's lots and lots of reasons for this. We're in a very unusual situation. Just think on, you know, um, if, you, if you were a head teacher, and, and I'm a chair of governors, so I, I'm not head teacher, but I get all this information every week from the DFE. You kind of get documents, and you know when they're posted, they're posted at midnight on a Friday, and it comes out, it'll be the latest set of rules and guidelines for going back to school, and it'll be 41 pages, and, and a head teacher has to respond to that over a weekend. And then the following week, you will get more. So on Sunday of last week, you know, we, we have another policy coming out about schools. Um, you have to also bear in mind that everything that happened at the beginning happened very, very quickly. Um, it's been a massive change to everything that we know. Did we ever think we would be queuing for food as our grandparents and our great grandparents did in World War II? That we would be actually told to stay in our homes unless we absolutely had to leave it for food or for medicine or for exercise, that we couldn't get our hair cut or our teeth fixed or our eyes tested, unless of course you could drive to Barnard Castle. So most of you had 48 hours to pack up and leave your desks, your workshops, your creative workspaces and go home. Most of us probably have been confined to our houses and the majority of us will have outdoor space, but some of us will not have that. You had 40 hours frantic frantic rush of copying worksheets and packs for children to take home or being told that you'd have to teach from home. Some of you using platforms you'd never used before and in some cases I'd never heard of before. And in this country, very, very few schools have ever delved deeply into the pedagogy of blended learning. So what happened is we fell and we fell deep into the world of teams Google Classroom, Slack, Zoom. So like Alice in Wonderland, we fell deeper and deeper and everything got stranger and stranger. So you were and you still are in a vacuum, which is almost a black hole. Because in the black hole, no time exists and all the days have merged together. And the only way that I ever know what day of the week is at Thursday around here is bin day. And that's the only day when I'm certain of what day it is. You've had no awareness of how long this is going to last. Um, 
generally speaking across the country people are reporting the inability to sleep more people are having dark intense dreams and people have a feeling of anxiety we've got loss and bereavement if we're year 11 tutors and heads of year no school prom no farewell assemblies as art teachers none of the final art assessments that we complain about every year right it's not there no moderations no exhibitions no thank you cards no chocolate oranges no farewells no writing on the shirts and then of course the pressure builds upon you depending on your school because i know there are some people here probably taking time off for this this morning because they are working longer hours at home on online teaching than they are when they're in school and yes we might have our own spaces i'm lucky i've got my own little loft space but most people share spaces some of you are using the cranky old laptop that school gave you seven years ago you might be getting constant emails from your senior leaders and there's a lot of you out there that are parents and you're balancing this against homeschooling your own children grappling with that deciding what today's meal will be it's got easier but it was really hard in the first few weeks keeping in touch with your family your friends and work there are people here that are going into school on a rotor to teach the children of the key workers the vulnerable students or this week your year 10s and your year 12s teaching at a distance and we've been manipulated and we've been persuaded by government rhetoric and propaganda and the media has also contributed to creating a pandemic of fear and some of us have also lost friends or relatives to this virus the human cost and there's the stories in the news every day right the prime minister announced last week a big summer catch-up what we found out later is he hadn't bothered to tell gavin williamson that he was going to do this and he hadn't bothered to tell the teachers unions and he hasn't bothered to work out how that's going to happen and obviously the unions are saying i'm sorry but we're not sending our teachers back into school and many many parents are actually saying we're not going to send our children back into school either and you will have noticed yesterday because you can't update this slideshow all the time is that they did a u-turn on the free school meals vouchers over the summer holiday and the saddest thing to say because i I'm, have a very good relationship with my own mp and she campaigns against holiday hunger all the time the reason that it has done a u-turn is that a celebrity footballer quite rightly got involved but that means that it's been done to basically satisfy the media who are influenced by a celebrity and i find that really sad as well so on monday they opened up the shops everybody was going to stand social distancing there wasn't going to be any problems these are the images that were in the newspapers the next day people just literally pushing and shoving okay so the other thing i'd like to say is that we also have to wonder about why not all children have been engaging in work at home or online and this is a diagram that illustrates what we call digital poverty and something that i talked about last week when we had a meeting of our parliamentary art group and which some of the mps were shocked at if you think about it we've got children in very nice mums net middle class families who've got everything they've got the outdoor space they've got table space they've got high speed internet they've got a tablet they've got a laptop they've got this they've got a craft cupboard and we've got the other extreme we've got families often refugee families who are housed in the top floor of a shared house with maybe a bed and some chairs and a shared kitchen and a shared bathroom and their children don't even have a piece of paper and a pen so the digital poverty and the digital divide that have come through is really significant um in, in in this kind of environment that we're in i mean 700,000 children in this country do not have regular internet access so they're not going to work at home and there are also reasons 
why the nice mums net kids are not all going to work at home. And some of those reasons are these. It's about motivation. Anybody that knows um, the flow theory, which is often related to activities in the arts, this was developed by Mahali Csikszentmihalyi, who is a um, Eastern European um, psychologist who spent most of his working life in America. And the flow theory is really important because the flow theory is about you yourself being completely motivated when what you do comes from within you. It's intrinsic. And when things are kind of hoisted upon you and they're extrinsic, you do not have anywhere near the level of motivation that allows you to develop the flow theory. And the flow theory is marvellous. You know yourself as artist teachers, we sit and do a, a, a drawing or a piece of art or some photography or whatever, you are lost in time. And that's the quote at bottom from Mahali. To be distracted against one's will is the surest sign that one is not in control. And this is one of the reasons why we are having such a mix of engagement from young people. Now, the other interesting thing is, as quite a lot of you here are on the NSEAD Facebook page, and I've taken obviously the name of the teacher off this, but at the beginning of last week, she posted up a beautiful little video that one of her year eight students had done. And the comment was that this child in the 12 weeks or whatever number of weeks we've now been on lockdown, had not engaged with a single piece of online learning until they were given a completely open brief and when they were given an open brief she sat down and it is a she and she developed a little video which i'm trying to connect to now but don't worry if i can't because i'll just talk you through it she made an animation about kind of the environment she lives in now and she used a lot of Banksy's work and Keith Haring's work and and the link between um, communities and love and and just did this incredible piece of work now if you look at the comment you know she hasn't done any remote learning lessons but this is great from the teacher I don't really care this is so much better and that's maybe what we want to think about what actually is learning are those kids that are baking the banana bread or doing the installations off a tree in the garden, surely they're learning. Are those children who've never had long periods of time to talk to their parents and to talk to their siblings, they're still learning. And I think the biggest problem we have is that they've escaped from education. And because they've escaped from education, they're making all sorts of decisions for themselves. But the other really important thing is we have to now think about what happens when they go back to school. And I'm going to be talking about something called a recovery curriculum. Now, any head teacher, head of year or member of senior leadership team in a school who thinks that children will come straight back to school and pick up the curriculum at exactly the same point at which they left it on the day their school closed is mad. Far too much has happened. And do you know what we really have to do as educators? We have to listen to what the children are saying. We have to look at what the children are experiencing. They have lost the key stability factors of their lives. They've lost routine, structure, friendship, opportunity, and freedom. All of those at a young age are actually triggers to these major areas that lead eventually in many people to post-traumatic stress disorder anxiety trauma and bereavement because none of this current situation follows the usual pattern of your school year the annual cycle of events that aligned with you and your own lives and their lives it's gone and also in secondary school there's great hormonal shifts as teenagers grapple with finding their own identity and their own destiny. So what are we in? We're in a period of true social disorder. 
social isolation in their lives and absence of the key adults. You also have a significant proportion of young people who are carers, carers for disabled adults, brothers, sisters. You also have the threat of poverty, mum and dad, whatever, might have been furloughed, they might have been made redundant in the last few days, the threat of job losses. And every single child will be different when they come back to you. You could say that most will have experienced something, some will not be bothered, and some will have no effects. But the majority of people are disturbed by this. And the only way we're going to survive it is with compassionate leadership and ethical leadership. It's crucial. Who sitting here today around this digital room would want to actually be a school leader right now? I am just the chair of governors and I'm absolutely exhausted by it. And the other thing is that schools are not just places of education. But very often, especially in the smaller communities, and, and um, I would probably put primary schools into this more, um, they, they, they are a hub of their communities. And John Dewey wrote over 100 years ago, the great 20th century educate, educator expert, that progressive education is actually there to correct unfair privilege and unfair deprivation, not to perpetuate them. And what school can do can be a leveller in our very divided society. It can be a leveller now that you wouldn't have the digital poverty if you were all had access to the same equipment. Some of your children only get to sit at a laptop when they're in school. So local communities look at schools as places of support. They actually look at us as people that know what we're doing, even though at the moment that is not how we see ourselves. So this is the time in our society to question what education is actually for and I'm absolutely heartbroken that some of you are telling me that when the children return in their bubbles and by the way bubbles is another nonsense word from Boris you can add it to the list of all the new ones you've never heard of you've never heard of furlough before you've never heard of pandemic you've never heard of social distancing you've never heard of self-isolating and bubbles kind of fits alongside the previous government uh, one for our school subjects, which art teachers will know about, which is buckets. So don't mix up your bubbles with your buckets. But this is what I'm hearing from, from teachers. My children are coming back to school and they are only going to have lessons in core subjects face to face. Whoa, slow down. Let's take the word core. And this is my question for you. What is the core purpose? of education. Isn't it about the whole child? And if it's about the whole child, how can we ignore what's happened in our lives? Because if we fall into an intense cycle of catch up, it'll be unhelpful to the staff, the pressure on you will be unbearable as well if your subject starts to be pushed out, and it will be unhelpful to the pupils because potentially it'll compound the anxiety and create other mental health difficulties. And last week I believe the Oxford University did a survey of so many thousand children and showed that one in five children are actually afraid to leave their home. And as a school governor I witnessed two children who had to be more or less dragged into school this week, children that need to be in school, and they were terrified of coming back into the, that environment because they had not left their house for the whole of the period of lockdown. They had not gone anywhere. They were terrified that anything they touched would attack them. So we're going to look at something now. Um, I don't want you to read any of these words, right? Because I'll talk you through it. About the recovery curriculum. And I'm going to tell you about this. All you've got to do is Google recovery curriculum. and You'll get this wonderful... Um, website which has been set up by Barry Carpenter and Matthew Carpenter and it's based on lots of empirical research from the work that's mainly done in New Zealand. It's about a systematic relationship which is a base, uh, based on the whole idea that when they come back to school you've got to reignite the flame of learning which has well and truly gone out with many children. 
And every school knows their own cohort and they can adapt it to them. If you also want some other advice as to how you can influence what goes on at school or just within your own department, you could look on the uh, website, which is the Anna Freud Centre for Children and Families, which has got some amazing um, valuable printouts and shareable documents. Dr. Bernardos, who are doing a lot of research at the moment on the effects of COVID-19 on children, and the Young Minds website, who brought out some fairly recent research on how children are feeling about everything. So I will talk a little bit more about the recovery curriculum, but um, I'm just going to put you onto um, this kind of image, which is about giving them the wings to fly and to go towards the future because they feel very much at the moment that they're kind of just stuck. Right. So we have to, first of all, our priority is the mental wealth of our children and ourselves, but they have to see a future. They have to have a vision that becomes one day a reality, which is why I loved at the beginning seeing all those things that you could do with being involved in the arts and, and being involved in the media. So there's the Anna Freud website, and they write a lot about uh, schools being communities and, and what that means. And um, there's a quote here coming up from Socrates. Maybe if we are going back to school and we are just doing the maths and the English and we're talking about GCSEs and we're talking about SATs, maybe we're just filling up the vessels. We're not lighting that flame. And maybe at the moment on the online work that a lot of children are doing, they're just filling up the vessels and nobody's lighting the flame. Because does that teenager want to sit down and draw from a still life setup because that's what they were asked to do? Or do they want to enlarge a portrait from a magazine picture using a grid because that's what they've been asked to do? Or do they want to carry on with the class project they were doing in February and March on doorways and windows? What would you have done when you were 14 or 15? Now, this is a very, very key question. Because this is where I want you to get a piece of paper and a pencil or a pen. And I want you to almost go back in time, just like Doctor Who does, right, get in the TARDIS. And I want you to think about yourself at 15. And what I want you to do, and I'm going to give you a chunk of time for this. I might even play a piece of music while you're doing it. I want you to draw yourself at 15. And you can do it in any way that you want. Visually, you can have words, you can have a diagram. You can have images. I want you to dig deep in your memory and your knowledge. Remember what it was like to be that age. What were you like? How did you dress? Not when you went to school, obviously. What was your kind of music? What were your interests? What did you bother getting out of bed for? Where did school fit in your 15 year old world? What did you think about the world and what was going on in it? What kind of things did you read? What were your friendships like? How did you get on with your family? What really mattered to you then? How did you feel about your place in the world? What were your dreams? What were your aspirations? What did you hope for? So what we now want is everybody to sit very quietly and go back to when you were 15 and to produce your drawing. I'm going to give you a chunk of time for this, probably about seven minutes, if that's all right with everybody. Okay, and if I come back in, you can carry on drawing while I'm talking.
Now I hope you're still kind of drawing even though the music's finished. I hope you've gone back to being 15 and just looking through um, some of the Gillian Waring comments that you put on which I've been able to do while you were doing that. I'm delighted to say that somebody said all they want is a pencil so I'm hoping this has given you that opportunity. Um, we want to be quite cheeky now and, and ask if some of you would volunteer to share your drawing and your thoughts about when you were 15 and which means that we can do this by you saying on the chat that you'd like to do it or you could put your digital hand up on the um, grid or the list or I can pick on people because I know a lot of people on this group so uh, Becca Nee would like to share hers hello <laughs> oh, Becca tell hello. us about when you were 15 okay this is really interesting for me because this is one of the reasons why I, I uh, have enjoyed pursuing my career as a teacher so I was really I kind of I have a school system where I started in year nine as soon as I hit year nine I just dive bombed my behavior was atrocious I was atrocious to my parents I got in with the wrong crowd and just school just kind of I don't know yeah wasn't great experience through my own choosing in a sense of like behaving badly and things like that yeah. so what did you have on your drawing <laughs> I don't know I only started it I can't see what you can see uh, well, we, you, everybody can actually enlarge you by clicking like on the speaker view. Yeah. See that? Wow, that's a really busy drawing. <laughs> so if you were 15, Becca, yeah. would you be sitting at home doing your lessons every day? No. Exactly. That's I would have really been breaking important. lockdown rules all over the place. Yeah, that is so important to remind everybody of that, isn't it? Yeah. That was very brave of you to share that, and thank you, and I'm glad you've grown up a bit. Yeah, definitely. Well, I think I think it's one of the reasons I think that's a really important thing to think about is that, um, and but there were areas of school that I really loved, and obviously it was art and, and yeah. graphics and things like that. And I think it's important that you know, that hopefully, when they do, they do go back to school, that you know they listen to the students' voice a bit more. I yeah. think that's incredibly important, and we don't tend to do that. And something I think that we get to do in our subject through group working through choices here's a theme how do you want to interpret that and we're really yeah. lucky we get that opportunity and a lot of other subjects don't have that so you're right Becca we've got autonomy where other people are not going to be able to go back and say we're not going to read Shakespeare right but we have that autonomy thank you so much for that now Ali Ali Haddon would like to share hers are you there Ali I'm here can you hear me yes yeah oh, there's my little thing here tell us all about it then if you can see it. Um, I want to know what you were like at, what were you like at 15, Ali? Um, well, I grew up in the, so, uh, the Thatcher years in Scotland. Um, yeah. So it was a, a brilliant time, certainly music-wise, because uh, there was a lot of subcultures. We had punk, we had skinhead, we had the two-tone, we had the psychobilly that I got into, lots of things. Um, we all went to football. We all were all involved in gangs in the early 80s as well, because that was another sort of reaction against Thatcher. And um, we closed down our schools three days a week when I was in my exams because of the uh, the teacher strikes and things like that as well. So yeah. it was actually quite a, a political and revolutionary period as well. And I think that's what sort of um, spurred me on. I had a great team of art teachers um, that were really passionate about what they did and they really ignited my interest in printmaking. Um, and that was sort of the sort of catalyst for spurring me on to go to art college as well. And, and probably why I've done sort of as passionate about what I do now as well. Um, so yeah, I suppose a bit of a torag, a bit of a tear away at times, but I was always very focused about what I wanted to do. I always wanted to go to art college. That was my, my ambition in life and the very support of uh, mum and dad um, who encouraged me to go there as well um, and, and really sort of pushed myself. But uh, well, I still think there's a bit of a tear away in me now as well but I think that's the great thing about being an art teacher you've got to be a bit of a maverick at times and a bit of a live wire um, yeah would yeah. you get, would you be sitting at home doing your maths and English then at 15 um no I'd probably be exactly. going out shoplifting or something yeah <laughs> or, this is the whole point yeah 
just to cause trouble, just to sort of like blow off steam. Yeah. But, um, but one of the things I, I think has been really great about what you've been saying about that uh, not filling vessels. Um, yeah. Um, in the last sort of month or so, um, we've, we've really tried to think about how we could sort of engage the kids. So now I've got a fantastic team at, at Reefing with me as well, and they've come up with some brilliant ideas. We're doing that recreate the painting now that's been quite um, popular on. on yes, yeah, the, the dressy up one, the Getty yeah, music. Mike doing Andy Gold's worthy really kind of sculptures, things that will just yeah. take them outdoors or use their imagination rather than just be sat in front of a, a, a screen scene copy this shoe or something so it's been it's been really great to see this as well so um oh thanks for sharing this that was me <laughs> and with, uh, is, is there anybody else who wants to confess to what they were like at 15 you can just unmute and talk ro are you hello, with... hello ro hello see you Come on, what were you like at 15 well <laughs> um so i was a 90s 15 year old so here's my wow. quick, quick scribbly drawing. Yeah, um, the first one. thing that came into my mind, quite embarrassingly, was um, Heather Shimmer lipstick, which was what my, my life revolved around, this lipstick from Boots. We all had it, everyone had it. So if you forgot yours, you never had to fear because one of your friends would have theirs, yeah. you know. So that was a, a big part of my life at the beginning. No, um, basically I've got, school was a massive part for me. And I know we're talking about teenagers who yeah. potentially it might not be the focus of their life. But for me at 15, it certainly was the biggest thing in my life because I loved school. I was quite academic. I had a lot of pressure from my parents, but I just, for me, school was more than just learning. It was, I lived in a village in the middle of nowhere. So school was my place to socialize. It was where I saw my friends. It was where I could succeed. Um, I used to get this bus, like took an hour every day. Mm. So the social time on the bus was a highlight of my day, especially at 15. Um, I've got, um, music was a definitely big influence. So we're talking like, when I think about, sorry, my son is tapping on the table at the moment. When I was 15, um, Killing Me Softly by the Fugees, that was like the theme song. Yeah for that age and uh, Blair and Oasis Wars. I remember desperately trying to save up money to get my Adidas Gazelles and, or Kickers or, you know, all that, that sort of nineties fashion. Um, get off the phone. I was constantly on the phone, but it was, was like a, a real, a real phone. phone then. Was that a real landline phone? Yes, in the cold, in the hall yeah. by the front door, like yeah. laying yeah. on the whole path with my legs up against the door, I remember. And you seem to have quite enjoyed going back in time here, Ro. <laughs> but because school meant so much for you, yeah. what would you have felt like during lockdown? I would have been absolutely beside myself because I was an only child, didn't yeah. particularly get on with my parents. And they didn't really, because I was arty and I have not come from an arty house at all. Yeah. Yeah. So I would have really, really struggled. Although I would have done every bit of work on the online <laughs> classroom or the equivalent if I'd have been sent work home you know yeah. but it makes me think what life would have been like if we were in lockdown then because you know exactly. we didn't even have mobiles what would we no, have done? no and you would have been suffering from that loss of friendship and that bereavement yeah and the sense of I I needed that um constant yeah. you're getting something right you're getting something yeah. right well done yeah I think I'd have missed that Ross, thank you so much for yeah. sharing. I want you to yeah, keep that yeah. drawing and show it to your children. Okay. They're here. And our last person is going to be Jess. Hiya, Jess, again. Hiya. <laughs> Hello, Jess. How are you? I can't see myself. Um, oh, oh, I've got, sorry, a video cover on my oh, thing. Yes. Hello. Hello, Jess. Uh, so, quick. Can you see that? 15. Yeah. There you go. So that's me at 15 with a tree and then all the sort of thinking and stuff that I was influenced by. So, um, yeah, I was a bit of a geek. I loved school and I would have been quite devastated again. Same as Ray, although Killing Me Softly by the Fugees was what was playing when I graduated as a teacher. So I'm a bit older than you. Um, but yeah, no mobile phones, no um, sort of ability to communicate. So how would I have done online learning uh, uh, if, if we'd been in lockdown? I was talking about this the other day with my husband, who's the same age as me. Um, so I suppose they would have sent packs home. So I would have sat at my, so there's my desk. Um, 
can see that there. That was my favourite space in my, I did have my own room. I was very lucky and I had a table, a desk in a, in a bay window at the back of the house and I'd sit there and just get distracted by what was going on in the outside world. Yeah. Um, and so I would have sat there with my pack of stuff, but I would have wanted, like Gray said, the feedback. Um, are you doing that well enough? So I don't know how they would have done that back in the days. Mm. Um, but yeah the lipstick thing made me laugh as well because <laughs> the uh, Rimmel lipstick um I used to, I was a really good girl I used to you know get to school on time go in early on Mondays for algebra um and stuff like that but um there were sort of rebellious things you would do like um sort of dyeing your hair slightly the wrong color um yeah. definitely do that now and um I also shoplifted Rimmel lipstick from the chemist up the road because they were really rubbish at keeping an eye on you. <laughs> I think your professions are coming through to do. Yeah, I know. Hopefully, it's so many years ago um, that I can't get arrested for that now. Um, and, and I do now pay for all my goods, I promise. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, it's kind of weird because I really enjoyed school. But then when I went to sixth form, um, uh, that's when I did my big rebellion. So, I think if, if I was a sixth former now, mm. I would be. Um, breaking lockdown rules, going out, meet my mates, um, hiding around the corner, smoking fags. I don't smoke anymore, but I did for a while. Um, and drinking disgusting things like Thunderbird or Lambrini. Yeah. yeah. And these are, these are these children. These are these people that yeah. we're expecting to all conform to new rules that they don't understand. That was well, fabulous, everybody. Yeah, sorry, I'm Jeff. Pretty, no, no, it's just going to say, I mean, like, I've just started working in a new school, so I've got that bizarre thing of no, none of the kids knowing who I am and not doing the kind of oh quick we've got to behave because Miss Austin Burdett's coming down the corridor or whatever which you know you know you get after a while of being in a school and um, so I've had a few conversations around behavior with a number of students and classes and have to set sort of new routines or new expectations and standards yeah. and a, a number of the kids in because I've always worked in uh, disadvantaged schools um, I hate that term but schools where there are a lot of students who struggle who come from very disparate backgrounds um, who don't necessarily have parents who can who want you know they want to support them in their learning or, or maybe they don't um, but all sorts of different things going on in the backgrounds of these children and they come into school to get some kind of support and structure from us and they've lost that um, so of course they're struggling and it's not just because they've not got access to uh, digital things mm. and equipment and resources at home although that is an issue it's beyond that it's it's the internal resources that they maybe haven't developed yet that's about self-regulation and um, internal validation mm. uh, which I you know I, I still struggle with that now I've struggled on some days in this lockdown where I've just got up and thought what's the bloody point yeah. and that's me as an adult and I you know and I've got a daughter that I'm homeschooling mm. and trying to run a whole department um, and work out what the hell's going on and stuff and I find it hard to stay motivated on some days I was talking about that in a group that I'm in last night where we sort of up and down up and down apparently it's called the corona roller coaster yeah it will be and, and it's only just begun yeah to be honest with you yeah the, the, uh, thanks very much everybody that's that shared the drawings I'm going to move on to the next few slides because otherwise I'm going to get wrong here for overrunning which I usually do anyway um this is Peter O'Connor and he is a New Zealand man and he's an absolutely brilliant and if you just do a Google search for Terito Twat which is um, Maori you can see all of the research that Peter's done he is the person behind the recovery curriculum that Barry Carpenter has picked up as, as a prime example and Peter goes all over the world after disasters whether it's a tsunami or an earthquake and creates the recovery curriculum he is doing that at the moment in New Zealand which is where we all want to live at the moment because they've got a decent prime minister and the recovery curriculum by the way is based around mainly children um, doing creative things there's a lot of storytelling in it and particularly working with younger children because they are more likely to be damaged by this than the more resilient older children so we have to now think about what can art do and what we might be able to do Anybody that's attending the NSEAD conference online, which is um, 27th, 28th, 29th of this month, there's going to be a student panel that are working with talking to Bob and Roberta Smith, and they've been asked to answer a question about what is it in the world, actually, 
that you would like to see different after COVID-19. Uh, that's a quote there from one of the boys from our Durham Sixth Form Centre who's going to be on that. And if anybody is an NSEAD member, I think you should log into that. I think that's going to be on the Sunday afternoon. And that voice is important. I told you that I do a lot of work internationally as well. And so I'm seeing the kind of drawings that children are doing around the world. This drawing by a very young child is incredibly significant. The child is terrified of going outside because outside is that big, green, snotty virus that you've picked up that image from the papers or from the television. And the only safe place is inside your house. So that translates even better when you're working with kind of more newer um, students and artists. I'm just clicking, and, oh, that's gone a bit fast, isn't it? I'm just looking at some images now. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm missing a bit there because I'm running out of time. But one of the things on the INSEA manifesto, I talked about INSEA, is that the visual arts really help students to understand themselves. It builds their confidence and their self-esteem. And it really, really does help with their own well-being. So INSEA has been behind in a number of art competitions. And the most interesting one and the most active one has been from the Chinese Arts Association because their 76 pieces of children's artwork is from the country that now feels vilified for having started it. And also, um, has, if you read the news yesterday, uh, Beijing schools have closed down again. And these are wonderful, powerful images that children have created around the coronavirus and what it's doing to them and their lives and their world. Um, I particularly like the one on the right hand side because there's a sort of sense of anguish in all of those faces. And the one on the left hand side, which is turning it almost into a computer game, isn't it? Just doing it like that. And there again, the little ones on the right are fabulous because this is from young children in Canada. And they were given plasticine and asked if they could make the characters into how they felt. And they spotted these kind of globes and wanted to put themselves inside the globes with their anxiety and their stress. And this is from children of about, you know, six, seven years of age telling us through art, actually using words visually because they don't have the language to describe those emotions and that's really really important and uh, this I only saw yesterday there's a national art exhibition uh, by six form college students and it's beautiful there's a lot of photography in there they are saying exactly the same things it's not, not all doom and gloom by the way there are some great celebrations of the enjoyment of actually being in that bubble at home. And I just think these are so powerful as images. They make me stop, look, think. And I'm also thinking how this student has communicated what it's like to be living in that room with that view for 13 weeks. You know, um, what your corner is like, what your words are, your poetry, your song, lyrics that you're writing for something that's important that corner of the room is what you maybe see every single day when you're logging on to your schoolwork and then these are also from canada and various different countries let's get rid of everything and there's other things going on in the world that kids are very aware of as well the whole uh, sustainability issue and obviously this which they're looking at the news, they're seeing this, they're getting involved in the debates and discussions about this. And I just think when they come back to you, they should be having that opportunity to do some art that is about the world that they live in, whether they feel negative about it or positive about it. And of course, if Banksy can do it, that's what we've got to say, isn't it? Banksy sat back and thought, well, I don't want to get involved in doing things about Black Lives Matters, but he realised that it was important to do it. And if what he says at the end, if white people don't fix it, someone will have to come upstairs and kick the door in. So what we are like age 15, that's what we've thought about. You have to maybe let that person let that out. And as I said, we don't have to force people just to look at the negative aspects of lockdown. But it's this whole thing about do they actually see a future? Will they bother applying for university next year? Do they think they will be able to go to university? 
are their parents going to lose their jobs in the greatest recession that we've ever had, apparently? All of these anxieties in people's lives. And the amazing thing is that I also have to think about you. Now, we do not have time to do this as an exercise today, but I'll show it to you because it's very straightforward. At some point today, you get a piece of A3 paper and you fold it into three sections. And on the left-hand side, you just put all the things that are worrying you at the moment, okay? And then you go to the right-hand side and you do the good things about lockdown because there's been loads of good things. The fact that we're doing this and people that could not have got to Norfolk today can take part. And you look, you've got your list on the left, things that are worrying me, and your list on the right, the good things about lockdown. And you take from the things that are worrying me, you only take from there the things that you have any control over and you put them in the middle. You don't take the things from there that you can't control, just the things that you can control. And then you go to the right hand column and you pull out the really lovely good things and put them in the middle column. And the middle column allows you to separate your thoughts and you focus on what's on that middle column. So you're getting rid of some things psychologically. And I will end with a quote, because I usually do. Um, it's Maya Angelou. I often quote Maya Angelou. These young people are coming back to you. They've had a tough time. Some of them can't wait to get back. Some of them don't want to go out the front door. You've got members of staff that don't want to go out the front door. How are you going to make them feel? Because people will forget what you said. People will forget what you did. But people will never forget how you made them feel. And that is my talk finished for the day. So thanks, Susan. That was amazing. Really, really informative and inspiring and so fascinating to hear everyone at 15, that how different everyone was, but also how art, you know, was so important to everyone here, really. Um, so now is the moment if you've got burning questions for Susan or for me and Tom, you can put those in the chat and we can kind of bring you on and we can talk about anything you'd like at this moment. I think there's some lovely tips here on makeup in the 80s and 90s. <laughs> it's true. Yeah. I remember the white mask well. Yeah. Oh, that's great. Thank you, everyone. That's really nice. Thank you. But um, we've kind of left the contact details on the screen here. Um, so we're very happy to help trying to be that, that kind of touch paper to inspire them to go off into their creativity, whether there's a workshop that we can deliver to assist you in doing that, we'd be very happy to. So please do get in contact with us. And also we're, we're open to your ideas. If there's anything that we're not doing or something that we're doing that you think we should be doing in a completely different way, please do let us know. And we'd like to discuss that further with you to see how we can support you and your students. Something that we are, are looking at and considering doing a bit more is, is introducing more therapeutic orientated tasks mm -hmm. uh, into, our, into our workshops as well to, to act as that vehicle for, for expression in quite a direct way. So hopefully some, that's something that you might be interested in working, working with us on. Yeah. And we're definitely looking on running those Wednesday workshops throughout the summer as well. So something to keep students engaged um, before September and we start to return hopefully to some sort of normality or a new normal yeah that's another new phrase that's I just know, really good, isn't it? It. new uh, if i hear the word bubble again i'll scream and um, so someone has asked where they can access the recording so as we mentioned earlier we have recorded this session and we'll be sending out a link to you via email so everyone will get this to look back over all of the information so don't worry if you feel like you've missed any detail it will be sent over to you 
Yeah, I've noticed somebody said that um, it's, it's not on the agenda of SLT to focus on the support students, but they will. And I think that point was made actually by, um, by several people is that you do have a tremendous amount of autonomy as an art teacher. You may not have access to the space and the equipment, but you can um, feed their minds visually with ideas and just introduce them to things, whereas many other subjects can't. So just do what you can and do it well. It's really nice to see we've had someone tune in from Singapore. Yes. And I'd just like to make anyone aware that has tuned in kind of internationally. We have got an international student panel this afternoon at half past four and that there's still plenty of time to book onto. So hopefully that will be really useful. And as you mentioned, Susan, great that we have been able to engage a much wider audience than we would normally. So definitely yeah. come out of this whole situation. Did I tell you why I did Made in China? Yes, I was messaging Sam in between the presentation saying, I wonder what it's going to be. <laughs> well, it, it was just because I, I sat up here and I picked something up off my desk and it's a really funny rubber, which is an ear. It's a joke one, right? Somebody gave it to me, it's meant to be Van Gogh, I think. And I was looking at the back of it and it says Made in China. And at that precise moment in time, an email popped up from my friend who works in Beijing who said, we're in lockdown again. And then I thought about the news last night and I th thought about COVID today and I'm thinking, was it all made in China? But that, is, that was it. <laughs> that was clever, yeah. yeah. And, and looking at what other people have put, other people have put some fascinating things that started the chat. Right. I can see we've had a question about um, Sculpture Matters this afternoon and all of the sessions that we're running will be recorded. So if you do sign up, to a session, um, then we can make sure that's sent out to you afterwards. Yeah. And also with Sculpture Matters, if they've signed up to this afternoon but have been called into school, um, as I mentioned, there is that second session on the 2nd of July that they could book onto. So hopefully, maybe that date might work for them as well. Yeah, Sarah Sanderson, can you remind me what you bring over from the right hand side to the middle column? The really good things about lockdown, Sarah. So your middle column. It's just things that worry in you that you can't, that you can do something about, but ignoring the other things and the lovely things about lockdown because there are some lovely things. Okay, I hope that answers that question. Yeah, in terms of those uh, potential worksheet, worksheets and the um, try, uh, the variety of career paths as well, we, we can look we will look to, to send those out to you. Um, so they're they're just in simple uh, PDF documents, and we can send that over to you via email after this session. Um, and I've just seen a message about the equipment for the sculpture workshop. Absolutely fine if you don't have all of the equipment, um, even if you haven't. Um, got half of it, that's absolutely fine. Worth tuning in just to see the nature of the activities and kind of take those away in your toolkit for the future. Um, and always fun to watch Des in a sculpture workshop. So worth signing in just for that. <laughs> absolutely. It's a series of different activities as well. So just because you might not have uh, one or two uh, resources, actually it, it's likely that you'll still be able to get involved with, with lots of different tasks that are in there. I think there's about um, five, tasks in each, in each workshop and um, so there's a real mixture of different types of things you'll be getting up to. First one's quite messy though, just be warned about that. And just a reminder, um, if you, once you've kind of made your sculptures this afternoon, please do send them to us. We're really excited to see what you're going to make. And we'll be doing a little showcase on the 2nd of July and probably throughout the series on our Instagram account. I think we should be auctioning off their work. Yeah. Great idea. <laughs> We've also got lots of other things happening, like we're doing a quilting through COVID-19 where we're encouraging um, students to submit little patches that we're going to turn into a big quilt that hopefully we'll be exhibiting at some point in the future um, at NUA or 
potentially in Norwich. So um, that's really exciting and trying to get students engaged with kind of tackling the issues head on and how they're feeling. So if anybody would like any information about that, there's some info on the website, but you can also get in contact with us as well. We had a, we've had a question about uh, will we be any, running any competitions for Key Stage 3? Uh, we don't have currently any, any plans to, to run any new, new competitions for, stage, for Key Stage 3, but that, that may change later on in the year. Uh, we introduced earlier on, uh, at the beginning of lockdown, our Creative Kindness competition. Um, we, that, was, that was actually for Year 7 uh, to, to foundation level. Um, so things like that will pop up from time to time, but we'll be in touch um, with you over email. Uh, to let you know about those things. And then the question about Unibuddy, that's something that um, we're actually kind of venturing into at the moment. So it's currently being set up. Um, so I don't have a date at the moment for when that's going to be going live, but that's something we can definitely send more information on in the future and keep you up to date with that. This is a question I'm unsure of. So we've had, had a question about the recordings um, for, for this afternoon. Um, and of course, like the Sculpture Matters session will be recorded. Um, but do teachers need to get in touch with us directly, individually, to, to ask for the recording to be sent over? No, so as I said, if they've signed up, and this is the same for any of the sessions, we'll be sending out the recording once it's ready. It might not be straight away, but um, if kind of the following week we'll be sending it out to those people that signed up and that's even if they couldn't attend but they signed up we'll be sending it out to them so if something has popped up that's absolutely fine you'll still be able to see it and take part in your own time well, I think you've done a brilliant job by the way anyway I think this is so exciting for people well, thank you Susan. It's really interesting seeing your presentation actually made us think um, about the way that we're delivering things and you know, that digital poverty divide is, is huge and is a real obstacle so we're really trying to look at different ways that we can address that and different materials that we can send out to people to um, overcome that a little bit so the kind of things that are forthcoming different handouts um, different worksheets that Tom has already mentioned. So hopefully, especially over the summer, we'll be looking to do a lot more of that. Yeah. Well, some of the kids used to be able to access their local libraries, you see, mm. and then of course the library shut down. And I even have a story this week of a family um, sitting outside a school with their kids and a couple of phones trying to access the Wi-Fi to download the lessons that the children had been set and I thought that is just not on is it the government promised um, something ridiculous like 20,000 laptops immediately six weeks ago and haven't delivered any of them to children just awful yeah it is thank you Lynn for answering the unibody question so that's <laughs> mid-July that that will be in, in place. So I think that looks as though that's kind of all of the questions. So we'll just leave it another minute or so, um, but then we'll kind of end the meeting. But thank you everyone for joining us. I hope it was valuable and interesting. Thank you from me as well. Are you, are you are you are you um saving the chat as well we can do that's a good idea i'd love to kind of keep track of all of those responses because yeah. um, if you do will you send it to me because it'll come yeah. the text file it'll save the text file. i'd appreciate that thanks Sam has just informed me that it saves automatically. So, um, oh, right. I, I'd like, I, how do you do that then, Sam? I wonder because on mine I've always got to do it manually. Is it because you've got super duper? Yeah. 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 Y
um, premier account, is it? Or because we've got super duper Sam. Yeah, <laughs> probably. <laughs> super duper Sam needs to tell me. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so I think that seems to be um, all of the questions. So thank you, Susan. Thank you to everyone who's here and watching. And we'll make sure to get that recording out to everyone. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thanks, Susan. Cheers. Thank you very much. Bye bye.